Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Flickster Church for God. My name is Peter Laws, and this is the show where I attempt to explore the deeper and sometimes spiritual themes of horror. Now, tonight I'm going to be doing a series of shorter episodes profiling some horror and other Blu-ray releases um, from a UK company called Fabulous Films. But before I do that, don't forget, if you're up for it, you can follow me on Twitter at Rev Peter Laws um, or at Facebook at the Flicks the Church Forgot. But also on SoundCloud, I am now present. So if uh, you want to get this show available as an audio podcast, including all of the archive episodes of the audio podcast show, then check that out. And lastly, don't forget that my per- uh, debut novel, Purged, is about to be released in February um, on the 16th. So I hope you might get a chance to check that out. Okay, anyway... Let's get all arty and cultured for our little trip to the night gallery. It's possible that Rod Serling's name will always be tethered to his breakout TV show, The Twilight Zone. And I guess fair enough too. I mean, that show contains some of the TV's finest science fiction, fantasy and horror moments. If you haven't seen the original Twilight Zone, then I do suggest that you seek it out and find out why it was such an iconic and uh, influential series. Yet when you talk to pure horror fans, and interestingly to many horror writers and directors, you'll tend to notice that they often will link Serling's name with his lesser known short story series from the 70s, which is called The Night Gallery. Now I gradually, here in the UK, I gradually became aware of The Night Gallery growing up, and I always longed to see it. But as far as I was aware, it wasn't shown on British TV, at least not when I was growing up, or not in a way I could access. So I had to wait until I was a full-on grown-up before I was able to source the DVD collection of just the first series. Now, fabulous films in the UK have fulfilled my quest, and I've been able to watch now all three seasons of The Night Gallery, and jolly good they are, too. Each episode opens with Serling in his signature suit, looking grizzled and dripping cool, all in colour. Uh, we see him strolling through a collection of very intense paintings that tease out the stories that are about to be told. And what brilliantly morbid paintings these are. You know, recreations of these paintings are sold now on eBay for the hardcore night gallery fan and if I had a big enough house and a big enough bank balance I would definitely buy a whole bunch of these paintings if you're interested by the way I particularly love the paintings for wait for it House with Ghost The Academy Nature of the Enemy The Dark Boy Lone Survivor The Messiah on Mott Street The Funeral, Whisper, Return of the Sorcerer, though I probably better hide this one if I ever do a Bible study around my house, and uh, Certain Shadows on the Wall. These aren't particularly my favourite episodes, but I love these paintings. Anyway, I'd need a much bigger house to contain all of that. Anyway, the paintings are a key aspect to the show, and they act as doorways in and out of each tale, but of course the tale themselves is is the most important part. Now, unlike the half-hour Twilight Zone, Night Gallery, at least for the first two seasons, um, ran for an hour's length, and so were able, were able to uh, fit in anything up to like four stories in any one episode. So these things are often like crammed with lots of stories of varying length. And now that every single one of them has been released on DVD in the UK, and I think they're available elsewhere in other territories... Um, it's almost like stumbling over a mahoosive collection of 70s anthology movies that you never saw. The sheer quantity of the stories means, of course, that the quality is crazily inconsistent. Serling himself was less than impressed with many um, of the stories on show here, for example, because he didn't write them all. Um, there are frequent super short sketches, comedy sketches that are dire, right? We might get, for example, a posh guy in a cape and he turns up at a blood bank saying like, I don't want to make a deposit, but a withdrawal. And he'll flash his camera, flash to the camera, his Dracula teeth to a comedy kettle drum. Ha, ha, ha. You know, these... These comedy moments are the very definition of face palm, and you can totally understand why Serling wasn't impressed with these kind of comedic interjections. And yet, and also some of the serious stories in the in the set are not that great. Some of them are quite mediocre, but there are enough gems in the entire box set to to encourage you to buy it and just sort of 
waltz through it like a like an explorer seeking out all of these macabre gems. For what it's worth, let me just quickly list some of the episodes that stood out to me, because there's definite, definite scares to be had. For example, an episode called The House, where a young woman who keeps having the same recurring dream of a house she dare not enter just keeps going over and over again. Or, or the simple and absurd episode called Green Fingers. That kind of really creeped me out in the end. Here, Elsa Lanchester plays an old lady being forced off her land by um, Cameron Mitchell in a really bizarre part, but he doesn't bank on her gardening skills. Fright Night is often quoted as being one of the scariest episodes. I think that's mainly for those who watched this as a little kid. Tell David is a really unusual and gripping tale of the dread of time travel starring Sandra D. Um, the Girl with the Hungry Eyes is a, I thought, a really cool and thought-provoking horror story about the power that magazine models can have over men. Or what about The Dark Boy, a touching and spooky tale by August Derleth, you know, the guy who was always bringing out Lovecraft uh, anthologies. That's about a teacher who's haunted by a dead fourth grade boy. The Phantom Farmhouse is a particular favourite of Guillermo del Toro, who does a commentary for it on here. That's a wild little story of werewolves. Um, I really enjoyed The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes. Uh, that leaves a real apocalyptic chill. The Hand of Borgus Weems also has a great little turn at the end, which sent a shiver down my spine. Oh, and Aunt, when um, Aunt Ada came to stay, starring James Farantino, where he's convinced that his, wife, his wife's aunt is a witch. There's like this melodrama to all of these scares, along with this 1970s vibe that makes them chilling, I think, in places. I guess some audiences would watch them now and just laugh at them, but for me, they evoke a kind of childhood fear, which I always enjoy revisiting. But I'd say Serling it is, is at his most profound when he's tugging your fear and heartstrings at the same time. There are stories like They're Tearing Down Tim Riley's Bar or The Messiah on Mott Street um, that, uh, that had me wiping sentimental tears away. He's got this great ability to write thought-provoking poetic dialogue, which just kind of out of the blue, like smacks you in the heart sometimes. Even his adaption, this is a great episode, there's an adaption of H.P. Lovecraft's Cool Air, which I, it adds something to the original that the original author Lovecraft skipped past, and that was a sense of emotional romantic loss. Cool Air is one of my favorite episodes of Night Gallery because it is creepy and it's mysterious, but it's also very tender and heartbreaking. I feel like Night Gallery is a great example of how horror um, can use the darkest themes to pull out the most noblest of emotions in the viewer. Serling was a brilliant writing talent with some truly clever and thrilling ideas, but he also understood that people watching horror were emotional beings too. You know, they were loving, uh, lo loving people, they were caring people. Uh, I love how this and The Twilight Zone made sure that they chilled the audience, but they cared enough to move their, their hearts as well. But Serling wasn't the only writer who hit gold with uh, Night Gallery. Many of the other segments are based on short stories from other people. And there's one, for example, which is a stunning entry from season two, which is narrated by Orson Welles. It's called Silent Snow, Secret Snow. This was based on a poem from the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Conrad Aiken, and it's all about a young boy who's fascinated with snow. Now, I don't think I have ever seen anything like that on TV before. When I watched this, it was so innovative and un unusual in its theme and execution. It kind of helps you realize that the night gallery, in the end, is like all galleries. Yes, it's home to more than a few duds, but it's also a storehouse for some bona fide masterpieces. My gallery is available now on DVD from Fabulous Films in the UK as a 10-disc set. Um, that's the complete series, or you can buy individual seasons if you prefer to dip in. The second season for me was my personal favourite, but there's, there, there's, there's good stuff throughout all of this, and bad stuff, so check it out. Well, that's it for now. Tune in next week for the next episode where I'm going to be looking at another release from Fabulous Films that has enough discs to tick your viewing box uh, for the rest of 2017. But until then, uh, share and subscribe uh, to this channel. Uh, follow me at Twitter at Rev Peter Laws, and SoundCloud and Facebook, The Flicks the Church Forgot. And don't forget, The Flicks the Church Forgot.